Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series. I'm Stacey McKenna and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Jonathan Shanzer here from the Foundation of Defense of Democracies join us to discuss the cause of the Middle East's next war. Dr. Shanzer will speak for roughly five to 10 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all questions, but we have many participants on this webinar. So I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Jonathan Chanzer. Thank you, Stacy, and, and thank you all for joining today uh, under these um, rather, um, well, different circumstances. I think we're all getting used to this now. Uh, I first wanna just say thank you to the Middle East Forum uh, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I, of course, wanna just note that I am uh, an alumnus of, uh, of the Middle East Forum worked very closely with Daniel for a number of years and have immense respect for the organization. Uh, so thank you for continuing to support it. I think it's an incredibly important voice, uh, especially at this time. Um, I, what I wanted to speak about today for, for just a few minutes is a, a, a topic that has uh, come to my attention over the last several months, uh, but I think it holds even more importance now as we head into this uh, time of acute crisis. Uh, as we all know, that over the last several years, the Iranians have been attempting to uh, finish what is commonly referred to as the land bridge. This is an area of territory where uh, Iran is able to exert control by way of proxies. These are the Shiite militias or PMUs as they're known, popular mobilization units. And they have been trying to extend Iran's influence across the Middle East. Uh, through Iraq into Syria and to Lebanon, where of course Hezbollah controls uh, a significant uh, chunk of territory, not to mention the government of Lebanon itself. Um, now, over the last several years, we have seen explosions take place, uh, specifically in places like Syria and Iraq. Uh, these explosions are often attributed to Israel, even if Israel doesn't claim responsibility for them. Israel has been striking with relative impunity uh, against Iranian targets. Uh, it's, this is a campaign that is commonly referred to as the war be between wars, the WBW or the campaign between wars, the CBW. Uh, and this is about Israel's attempts to mitigate uh, a crisis before it occurs. So in other words, these are preemptive strikes against weapons that the Israelis have described uh, in, in euphemistic terms as game changing. Now, what we have learned in the last six months to a year is that these weapons, we, we can be a little bit more specific about what they are. And really what the Israelis have been striking at 90 to 95% of the time are parts uh, or perhaps entire munitions known as PGMs, precision guided munitions. Now, everyone knows that uh, the Iranians have been providing rockets, they've been providing missiles to their proxies, whether Hamas or Hezbollah or uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad or some of the other groups in Syria and Iraq. We've seen them used in the past, but usually those rockets are unguided. Uh, we could call them dumb rockets. Many of them fall short of their intended targets. Many of them fall uh, far, uh, far afield, far longer than what their intended targets may have been. With the PGM project, the Iranians are now able uh, to ensure greater precision. They are able to strike targets, uh, at least theoretically, within five to 10 yards of where they intended which will change things immeasurably for the Israelis. Because of course we know that Iron Dome has been able to strike down many of these munitions when, they, uh, when the Israelis can ascertain their trajectory and know that they're going to land on Israeli targets, they will strike the midair. And then of course they allow for the ones that fall short or, fall, or far long, they allow them to just uh, explode uh, and the Israelis don't need to do anything about it. The PGM project right now will allow Iran's proxies uh, to either evade Iron Dome um, or to overwhelm it by potentially, if let's just say there are 20 
uh, interceptors in a, in, in, a, in a given battery, if you fire 21 PGMs at a specific target, you could begin uh, to overwhelm just by numbers. And really, one PGM getting through to, for example, the chemical weapons or ke the chemical plant, rather, in Haifa, it could be the equivalent of a chemical weapon attack, uh, an attack on the purported nuclear facility in Demona would be the equivalent of a nuclear attack. And then of course there are, uh, there, there exists the possibility of simply striking high density uh, civilian targets like apartment buildings in Tel Aviv, or even the Kiryah, the, the Pentagon of Israel in Tel Aviv as well. These are the sorts of things that the Israelis are deeply, deeply concerned about. This is why they're striking on a regular basis. They are taking out either parts Sometimes they're taking out engineers. Uh, sometimes they're taking out entire munitions or even facilities that are building these munitions. Um, now, we understand that uh, they've had almost total dominance in places like Syria and Iraq. The problem is in places like Lebanon, where these facilities are being built underground. Uh, it's much harder for the Israelis to strike without prompting a full-blown war. Um, and it's for this reason that the Israelis are beginning to warn that Hezbollah is uh, treading on dangerous ground. And uh, the Israelis have reached out to the State Department. They've reached out to the Europeans to try to get the, uh, the, the Lebanese to, to, uh, to try to extricate some of these weapons from Lebanese territory before the next war begins. Of course, this is all happening at a time of a pandemic. Uh, and at a time where the government of Lebanon is uh, barely functioning at all, they're about to head into a financial crisis as they have defaulted on some of their loans. And it's really unclear whether the Lebanese uh, can, can do anything to stop this. Similarly, in Syria, the government there has very little recourse um, in terms of what Iran puts on the ground, and they maybe even welcome uh, this uh, precision guided munitions project. Uh, of course, we know that the Assad regime in Iran are longstanding allies. And in Iraq, we know that the, uh, the Iranians have exploited the uh, sort of gray zone, uh, the inability of the, of the Iraqi government to maintain control over weapons and borders. And so, uh, and again, this could be a government that is very willing to work with the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards, in allowing for all of this to take place. Now, the Israelis, I should just note, are not the only ones who are worried about the uh, PGM project. Uh, we know that uh, PGMs have been used against uh, Saudi Arabia last year, the attack on the Abqaiq facility, that uh, significant oil facility that was, uh, that was blown up uh, and taken offline for several weeks last year. That was the result of a precision guided munitions attack uh, by the Iranians. Uh, we also know that the response to the, to the assassination uh, or the liquidation, I should say, of Qasem Soleimani earlier this year, the response on the part of the Iranians was a PGM attack on a joint Iraqi-US base. Um, and they were able to, uh, to fire off precision weapons to ensure minimal casualties and minimal damage, but were, I think, sending a message that they could have hit uh, with greater precision and could have carried out a mass casualty attack. And so this, of course, raises questions about U.S. force posture, U.S. Uh, force security in the region, our Arab allies, and more importantly, I think right now, um, the, the sort of overall question of whether the Iranians could prompt a, uh, a, a larger war, whether by provoking the United States uh, or provoking the Israelis. I think the Israelis right now are uh, more inclined to strike. They've warned that this is uh, second only to the Iranian nuclear program in terms of the threats that they face right now in the region because PGMs could have the equivalent of a chemical or biological or nuclear or mass casualty attack. So it's, it's for this reason that I believe that PGMs, precision guided munitions, are likely to be the cause of the Middle East's next war unless we're able to find out a way to get the Iranians to stand down uh, or to get uh, the, uh, the Hezbollah to stand down because I believe this is where uh, uh, it, it's, it's obviously it's all originating from and certainly right now we don't see any sign uh, of letting up. So I'll end there and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for that. Uh...
briefing. It's slightly terrifying, um, but we appreciate your time. Um, do you believe that Israel has the ability to take out Iran's nuclear capabilities? It's a tough question and one that I think many have been struggling with. Um, the, the, the nuclear capabilities right now are, of course, spread across a number of different facilities. I, I'm by no means a, uh, a, a nuclear expert, but everything that I've heard about from the Israeli ability to neutralize uh, the, the program, it would require uh, a huge effort on the part of the Israelis. Um, and it would be challenging given that they would have to fly over hostile airspace, most likely refuel several times, and then hit targets that are deep beneath the ground with munitions that, um, well, let's just say they would need uh, special munitions from the United States, and it's not even clear whether they have the delivery vehicles uh, to bomb some of those targets that are deep beneath the ground. But I do believe that Israel has the cyber capabilities and the technical capabilities necessary to do that if necessary. I should just note that the PGM project does not require the same kind of, um, of strike capabilities on the part of the Israelis. Uh, the challenge, of course, is the human shields element of it, specifically in Lebanon, uh, because if the Israelis strike, it's not that it's so far beneath the ground, but it, it's, it's you know, usually targets that are beneath hospitals, schools, apartment buildings, and the like. So there would be significant fallout in terms of public relations battles that might ensue. Thank you. Short of regime change, what can be done to change Iranian behavior or their revolutionary ideology? Well, we're, we're seeing a good bit of this right now from the Trump administration. I think they have uh, their maximum pressure campaign has been one that's been extremely effective. Uh, and by the way, that campaign, I think, can be amplified significantly by just simply pointing out that this PGM uh, project continues while Iran is uh, crying foul, saying that uh, the sanctions uh, on the country it, uh, are prohibiting them from being able to treat their own people. To be very clear, this PGM project costs money. It costs tens of millions or perhaps even hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on how far back you see them uh, doing this and, and uh, for, for how many years and, and how many uh, of the targets have already been destroyed. This is something that Iran continues to try to do. They, they choose to divert money toward uh, the efforts to target the United States, Israel, and our other allies in the Arab world. They do this at the expense of their own people. So I think there's an important messaging campaign that could go alongside the maximum pressure campaign, psychological, uh, psychological operations, and other means of American power to ensure that the Iranians stand down or that perhaps ultimately our efforts could lead to regime change. Can you say anything about the role of Russia, good or bad, with respect to Iran and the PGMs? Well, we know that the uh, Israelis have gone to Russia on dozens of occasions and have had to ask, uh, or perhaps better put, to tell Vladimir Putin that they are about to strike these strategic targets, uh, specifically in Syria. Um, and as we understand it, there is a good working relationship. It's not, I don't want to say it's friendly because I don't think that is a fair way of describing it. It's a professional relationship, one in which the Israelis uh, are, are conveying to the Russians that they have a job to do, which is to clear the region of the weapons that they see as a threat to their existence. And so the Russians have, at, at least until now, complied. But of course, the problem is the Russians are still working with the Iranians, they're still working with the Syrians, they're still working with Hezbollah, um, which means that these are, these are actors that are gonna potentially go strong, uh, grow stronger by working with the Russian military. And I think that's the long-term concern, but uh, on a sort of a tactical day-to-day -day basis, the Russians do seem to be willing to stand down when the Israelis have things that they need to clean up. Great, thank you. Um, considering the social, socio-economic situation in Lebanon, do you believe that Hezbollah would be allowed, oh gosh, <laughs> would be allowed, oh my gosh, sorry, ah, it just went away, sorry, what can we, uh, what can be done to change the Iranian behavior? How long do you think the Iran government can survive? 
Well, uh, that's a tough question because it's not like uh, they are uh, going to Ernst & Young and, and reporting their, uh, their quarterly earnings. A, a lot of their economy is, is below ground. A lot of it is black market, gray market. Uh, but we do understand that their cash reserves are dwindling. Uh, they are running on fumes. Uh, but of course, their entire way of operating their government is uh, running on fumes. They've been doing exactly that under sanctions for years. Of course, they had a reprieve after the deeply flawed 2015 nuclear agreement that afforded them roughly $150 billion, give or take, uh, in sanctions relief that gave them the lifeline. But they are back roughly to where they were likely at around 2013, uh, which was when they entered into the interim deal that began to offer them sanctions relief. So we get a sense that this is the moment of opportunity that if we're going to be able to force uh, the regime to begin to change, this is around the time that we should be thinking about it. The problem, of course, is that the ideology of, of this regime and the leadership of this regime, they're not exactly eager to, uh, to bend. They're not going to be flexible. And of course, the terms that would be offered to them this time around, I think, would be nowhere near as generous as they were under the previous administration, so we could be at a stalemate. What do you think the chances are that Iran will receive the loan from IMF, and will the oil price seriously erode Iran's capabilities? Well, the oil prices absolutely have. I mean, that we've seen, I guess, a, um, some good news for, from the Iranian perspective anyway about a deal cut between the Russians and the Saudis about uh, cutting production. But right now, uh, global demand is, is at such a low point that it, it, it really just doesn't seem to be helping a whole lot. Their, their budget uh, in Iran is based on a, on a uh, price of oil that is nowhere near where we are or where we are likely to be for, I think, months. So uh, in that sense, I think they're going to be suffering significantly. Um, and uh, and I, think that's, I think that is good news. So I think the question is if we can continue uh, to cut down on Iran's ability to sell oil on the black market, that'll help significantly. Also, I think just looking at oil byproducts, uh, distillates and, and, and other products that, that Iranians make money, that the Iranian regime makes money from, these are things that we could be thinking about as well. But uh, certainly for right now, uh, this is good news when we think about sanctions and economic constriction uh, of, of the regime in Tehran. The confrontation between Israel and Iran is through proxy parties and proxy territory. Could a situation arise where Israel strikes Iran directly and what kind of scenario would it take? Well, this is exactly, I think, what we're talking about right now with the PGM uh, threat, where the Israelis have been warning for the last, let's say, year or two uh, that an escalation in, in, in Lebanon would lead the Israelis to actually strike the source. And we have seen this as a new doctrine that has been rolled out by the IDF. It is a direct threat to the regime in Tehran that if they empower or order the, uh, the Hezbollah uh, military uh, to strike at Israel, that Israel will not only strike back at Hezbollah, but at every other uh, force that was responsible for this. And really that just means the regime in Tehran. So, um, I believe, again, when we talk about what could prompt the next conflict in the Middle East, I believe it's the PGMs. And it's, by the way, it's not just Hezbollah. Again, it's Shiite militias that are operating in Syria and Iraq. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister has also mentioned that there are, um, that there are PGMs in the hands of the Houthis in Yemen. So uh, across the board, these non-state actors are gaining the capability of what is effectively a JDAM. Uh, the Joint Direct Attack Munition. This is a munition that has enabled the United States to dominate the battlefield since really the, the mid to late 1990s. The fact that Iran has been transferring this technology into the hands of non-state actors is a gross violation of the existing norms. We've never seen anything like this before. Uh, and the, the ability of these proxy groups to use it effectively against Israel uh, would certainly, I think, lead the Israelis to strike Iran. But also don't forget that, that if these proxies also try to use these PGMs against the United States, you could see action as well. They already have fired them at the US. The question is whether they provoke again 
um, or, or in ways that, um, that push the United States to take more dra drastic action. Thank you. And then this will be our last question for this webinar. Considering the socioeconomic situation in Lebanon, do you believe that Hezbollah would be allowed by the Lebanese people to strike knowing that the Israeli reaction would be devastating to their country? Well, this is, I think, a really interesting question and one that I've, I've raised now with, uh, with Israelis, with Gulf partners, with, with, with a number of U.S. officials. Uh, and that is, you know, right now the, uh, the Lebanese people are in dire need of a bailout. They've just defaulted on their first euro bond uh, worth more than a billion dollars. And there's going to be another, uh, give or take, another four billion dollars coming due. And the, the, the Lebanese people are simply unable to pay it back. The government is in dire straits. And so the question is, uh, could a deal be struck where the Lebanese armed forces are asked to remove the PGMs from the country? Uh, in an effort to stave off conflict. Now, I, I, to me, I think this is worth exploring because uh, as you know, that there are the efforts underway uh, on the Hill and, uh, and elsewhere to defund the LAF and to potentially cut off the Lebanese government. And I would say that those calls are absolutely on the mark because the LAF has been partnering with Hezbollah. They, they've turned a blind eye to a huge amount of this activity. So the question is, if we could get the LAF to do this now uh, for some interim relief, this could be the beginning of a start of reform. The problem is, is that I, I just can't um, really get a, a fix on whether the LAF would do this and whether they would be um, responsible, whether they would be dependable. Um, but if they're not able to do it, I think we have our, our, the answer to, to this longstanding question of whether we can work with them or should continue to fund them because they are that they are the actor currently responsible for what has happened, this buildup on Lebanese soil. But certainly the Lebanese people don't want this. I think the Lebanese people would like a bailout instead of a war. And as the Israelis have warned quietly behind the scenes, whatever suffering they're feeling right now from the COVID-19 crisis or from the financial woes that they're dealing with, it would pale in comparison to the devastation that the IDF would bring on the Lebanese uh, people inadvertently of course but it's because of the fact that you have this human shield problem that hezbollah has created the israelis are trying to warn that it's the people of lebanon right now the government such as it is the lebanese armed forces who can prevent a crisis uh, the israelis have made it clear what the problem is and uh, it's going to be up to the lebanese now to try to solve it all right with that we have come to the close of our webinar thank you again for joining us today uh, to okay. discuss all that. And uh, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry will resume as scheduled this Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, to discuss all things Israeli. And thank you all of our viewers for joining us and have a wonderful day.